Episode 749, How to Have Deeper Learning in Better Schools. Pear Fair is here this Wednesday, July 28th, and I'll be presenting eight ways to engage every learner. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn more and even how to see the event if the time has passed. So join me for Pear Fair. Welcome to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast, hosted by author, educator, speaker, and mom, the cool cat teacher, Vicki Davis. I'm so excited. Today we have Professor Jal Maida from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He is co-author of In Search of Deeper Learning, The Quest to Remake the American High School, which is also the winner of the Grauemeyer Award for Education. Now, I found out about you, Jal, through a New York Times article that you and your co-author, Sarah Fine, wrote uh, that school doesn't have to be boring. What is your thesis behind that statement? Well, one really interesting thing, Sarah and I went to visit 30 high schools across the US over the last 10 years. And we noticed that there was a really different energy between schools during the day and after school. So we spent a lot of time looking at the extracurricular elective and student club realm. And the level of energy and vitality you would see in a theater production or a debate club or dance studio, it's more like a workshop. Students are the producers. They are the ones doing the work. There's a lot of apprenticeship learning and so on and so forth. And the difference between that and the way how in most classes students were passive recipients of knowledge, filling out worksheets, five paragraph essays, experiments for which the results were already known in advance was just really striking. And then the best teachers had really embodied that kind of workshop students as doers spirit during the day. And so the thesis of our article was, could we get this kind of spirit and energy we see in what we called the periphery into the core. And we know it's possible because we've seen lots of teachers do it, but it really goes against the pacing guidelines, the state tests, the short periods, a lot of the things that are part of the grammar of schooling. At my previous school, my class has always been very project-based. I had a thank you note from a student I was reading today that said, thank you for letting me move around and do important things. But I recall at my previous school that when my principal was preparing to observe me, he had to let me know ahead of time so that I could be, quote, teaching. Now, that's not the way in my current school, but basically that meant I should be at the board lecturing. So the three times I, quote, lectured and we had a, you know, sort of a Socratic type conversation was when I was being observed, even how we observe teachers somewhat pushing us to not the best way of teaching. Yes. Teachers said that teacher evaluations, pacing guides, and state tests were the three biggest barriers to teaching more deeply or teaching for deeper learning. So I think your experience is representative in that sense. I remember once I was teaching at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and we have a a room with all sorts of white marker boards on them. And so students come in, and the first thing that, that happens is I hand them a marker and then you know i give them some sort of prompt and they go in groups of four or five to the wall and they start writing and then they write on each other's writing and so on and so forth and a woman stuck her hand up and she said you know Joe, i teach in an elementary school and in our elementary school they discourage us from writing on the walls mm. and i said i can i can see why that would be the case but you need some different walls there are a lot of advantages to being able to write on the walls well and i'm also curious those teachers that you observed do you have to choose between testing and deeper learning or can deeper learning lead to higher achievement? In the long run, deep learning will lead to higher achievement because deep learning is just having a more thorough understanding of a subject. So, you know, the difference between shell and deep learning is the difference between being able to name the parts of a cell and being able to understand the functions of the cell and why the cell works the way that it does. In the short run, though, sometimes there is a a dip as people are figuring out how to teach in a new way. And thus, yeah, so there can be a dip in the short run. It also depends a lot on the test. So Mm -hmm. if the test is, you know, a mile wide inch deep kind of history test, then even if I have a friend whose husband is an intellectual historian at Yale and he, she gave him the New York history regions and he couldn't pass it because 
you know, that's just not the kind of history that he does. So, you know, so it depends a little bit on the test. That really says a lot about about the test. Now, you said a dip in the short run. So if a school is wanting to move to deeper learning, thorough deeper learning, I will tell you that I have some students that I taught 10 or 12 years ago that we sit down and we have conversations about the principles I taught them about change and technology 12 years later. And I didn't give any tests. Uh, Modeled much after my favorite professor, Dr. Adler at Georgia Tech, he didn't give any tests and I can sit down with him all these years later, I won't say how many, and have those conversations. Do we have to be willing to weather the dip in the short run so that we can experience true transformation? Or how does that work in a school? I mean, if you're really concerned about the test, something they do at Expeditionary Learning, for example, is over the summer, they look at the standards that are going to be evaluated in the next year. And then they think about, you know, they sort of align the projects with the standard. So if the standard is like, you know, understand the difference between correlation and causation, you know, you can do that out of the textbook, but you can also do it in lots of real world situations. So schools which are committed to projects and committed to raising test scores can do it by essentially like plotting the projects in ways that align with the standards on the test. But I think to the story that you just told about both your student and your relationship with your professor, you know, we really need to think in terms of the long game. Like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to turn students on to things that they might potentially be interested in. We're trying to give them new interests. We're trying to give them new identities. And if you do that, I mean, that's what you're trying to do in education. So you can feel good about yourself when you go home at night. So, Joel, what has this year of pandemic or year and a half of pandemic teaching taught you about deeper learning that you did not know before? I didn't really believe that or at least I hadn't seen people doing deeper learning online. And at least at the higher ed level with students who had chosen to be there and were committed and interested in the subject. You know, I taught a class on deeper learning and we had students logging on from, you know, everywhere from California to India to China to Africa. And we came together and we were discussing similar issues in different contexts. So I think There is some research which supports this, which is that once students are interested and engaged and sort of committed to uh, learning something, then a virtual platform can work just the same way you would use a virtual platform for a meeting or other forms. It's when you're trying to use a virtual platform, as many schools were this year, to try to engage students in things they're not interested in is is, is really challenging. That's fascinating. So it, it really just depends. It does depend. Wow. So as we finish up in search of deeper learning, the quest to remake the American high school, if you could wave your magic wand, Joel, today, what kind of changes would you make on a broad scope in American high schools? That's a great question. I would have students take fewer things at a time. So no more than three or four subjects at a time. Some schools in the pandemic moved to a quarter system where there were three or four things at a time. And that also reduced teacher load. So the number of students teachers were responsible to dropped from 150 to 75 or so. I think that's critical if teachers are going to give real feedback on student work and build relationships with students. And then within those things, I would adopt a firm kind of less is more approach. In British Columbia, they try to teach five key ideas and five skills per subject per year. And I think that's about right. Like That would give you enough time and space to do things in depth. The last thing is teacher professional learning time. I would give teachers a lot more control over that time and a lot more opportunities to have experiences that are parallel to the kinds of experiences that we're hoping that they would give to students. I'd also like you to weigh in on... You know, a lot of schools, uh, there's a local school here that got rid of everything but core subjects for this and is even talking about that's how they're going to get caught up. They're not going to put back in theater. They're not going to put back in music. They're not going to put back in these additional elective courses. Uh, Does that raise any red flags for you? I don't see private schools doing that. Yeah, I don't think that is the way to go, right? So the idea that motivates that is that 
students missed some math and some reading and that they need to do those things. And I wouldn't disagree with that. But those other things that you just mentioned are often the things that engage students in school. And you can learn a lot of the kind of core skills in the central subjects through those things. So I think that is the opposite of the approach we should be taking. I mean, I think, again, we should sort of think with a scalpel rather than, you know, a sledgehammer, right? So like, if you have a first grader who, you know, this was their year that they were going to learn to read and they didn't learn to read, then like in second grade, I wouldn't have them like chasing butterflies. I would like spend a lot of time supporting them on developing their reading, though I would have let them pick some books that they're interested in and some topics they're interested in and so forth. Whereas if you have a seventh grader who, you know, missed a unit on like the French Indian War, like they can live without it. And if you're an 11th grader and you missed an internship that you need for, you know, to lead to your associate's degree, then that calls for a, a different response. So I think schools should just do a pretty specific needs assessment of what sorts of things their kids have missed and what sorts of things they might you know, need to get back and then make decisions on the basis of that. And then the last thing I'd say is the kids didn't just miss a little bit of content. They also missed a sort of whole year of childhood. So we, we kind of owe that back to them as well. Absolutely. And many are coming back with many social emotional struggles that will also impact learning. It's just, it's a, it's not just back to normal, is it? No, it depends where you are. But for a lot of kids, it was a really devastating year. Yeah. For a lot of kids, though, there was also, you've seen some of this in the media. It's hard to quantify exactly how many, but some kids liked being at home. Kids were more autonomous and independent. When they were at home, they could go to the bathroom when they needed to. They could get food when they needed to. And so I also hope that we can sort of take some of the more human elements of home and put them back into school when kids go back to school. Oh, that's fantastic. The book is In Search of Deeper Learning with Jal Maida and Sarah Fine. And thank you for this conversation. I think it's going to provoke a lot of administrators that send these podcasts to their teachers and spark conversations at their schools. And I think this is one of those that will spark those conversations and also have a lot of us reading the book. Thank you, Jal. Thank you so much. Welcome back to School Educators. Pear Fair is back with another hit virtual event designed to energize and equip you with the resources you need to make this year a success. Pear Fair from the amazing Pear Deck is happening Wednesday, July 28th, and I'll be presenting eight ways to engage every learner, along with many other fantastic educators. Just go to PearDeck.com forward slash Pear dash Fair. That's P-E-A-R deck.com forward slash pair dash fair to reserve your seat and it's free. There are two tracks to this conference, one focusing on pedagogy and hot topics and the other on best practices for using Pear Deck and Go Guardian. You can mix and match your tracks, so reserve your spot now. Now, don't worry. If this event has already passed, you can still go to the website and register as many recordings like mine will be posted after the event has passed. So go to paradeck.com forward slash pair and join me at an awesome back to school virtual event. If you enjoyed today's 10 minute teacher podcast, why not subscribe on iTunes? You can also catch up with Vicki on Twitter at Cool Cat Teacher or level up and learn with her blogs and free resources at CoolCatTeacher.com. Thanks for listening.